As I said earlier, my name is Aaron Clems. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, where I work on communications and legislative work. And I'm working in a project uh, to try to pass the, the, the Smart Salting Bill. And one of the key players in this longtime project that's been going on for several years now is joining us today. Her name is Sue Neeson, and she comes from a group called Stop Over Salting. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sue to introduce herself. Um, yes, um, I'm a citizen advocate. I'm actually a Minnesota water steward, and we are trained by the Freshwater Society and supported by our watersheds. And I'm out of Minnehaha Watershed in Hennepin County. And Stop Over Salting is a citizen group. We all met in our, our Minnesota water steward training, and we're community volunteers, and we'll talk to anyone who will listen about best practices in winter maintenance and reducing the ice reuse. Thank you, Sue. Um, you know, and, and just thank you generally, because the fact that we're having this conversation today has really been driven by this core group of citizen activists who've been working on this bill for several years, at least since 2018. Is that the first year that was that was that the bill was introduced, Sue? Uh, it was introduced a couple years before that, but it didn't get any committee hearings. Okay, so it's been even longer than that. I mean, it, and the, unfortunately, for folks who follow the legislature, you know that sometimes it takes a couple of sessions for a bill and idea to get traction. And, you know, our goal this session is to get this bill over the finish line. And the reason why we're able to take that approach is because of all the work that's gone into advancing the bill in previous sessions and all the bipartisan work that's gone into it. So thank you, Sue, and all the folks who worked on this all along. And we're happy to come in at this point and try to provide a little bit of help uh, to get it over the finish line. Um, also, we want to thank MCA supporters. You make this work possible. Uh, we really appreciate your support of our legislative program as well as all of our work. Uh, if you're already a supporter, thank you. If you are thinking about making a contribution, please consider it and go to mncenter.org slash donate dash MCEA uh, to make a contribution to support this work and all the work that we do at MCA to protect our water and our climate. Um, and we're going to get started by talking a little bit about just the problem. I mean, I think a lot of folks are really unaware of how much salt is applied every year I mean, I was floored, Sue, when I learned that 350,000 tons of salt is applied to roadways, parking lots, sidewalks in the Twin Cities metro alone every year. And that's old data. That's like about seven or eight years old. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the science uh, that's showing us that there's a problem with chloride pollution in Minnesota. I would be happy to. Um, so just... Um, a quick background. So de-icing salts, they're chemical compounds that contain chloride. And chloride lowers the freezing point of water, it causes melting or prevents the formation of ice and chloride is the problem. And the terms de-icing salts, chlorides and de-icers are used interchangeably. And I tend to do that when I talk. So I just wanted to say they're all the same thing, basically. Um, so first problem with chloride is it's a permanent pollutant, and a lot of people don't realize that, and it's accumulating in our waters. What happens is during melting, the chloride molecule and the water molecules bond so tightly um, that they don't separate or degrade over time. And removal, the current technologies we have are way too expensive and impractical to use. So chloride um, travels with the melt water wherever that water goes. And where is it going? It's, here's the problem, going into our lakes, streams, and groundwater. And um, there it tends to accumulate because not only is it permanent with the water molecule, but that resulting uh, salty water is also really heavy. So um, U of M did a study that showed that over three quarters of the chlorides that are applied in the Twin City metro area stay in the metro area. So it's not like it's washing downstream like we think of a lot of other pollutants. It's, it's right here in our water and in our soil. So we have this permanent pollutant <clears throat> and you can't, another problem is you can't, you don't see it once it's dissolved in water. Salty water looks clear for so, for many people, <clears throat> it's out of sight, out of mind. 
We've got a lot of data that shows that isn't true. Um, in Minnesota, we use the EPA standard to determine if a water body is impaired for chloride. Just one teaspoon of the icer puts five gallons of fresh water at the chronic standard for impairment for aquatic life. That's 230 milligrams per liter. We wear these spoons because this is a teaspoon, you know, the same thing you use when you're making your chocolate chip cookies. Um, but if you would please visualize a five gallon like Home Depot orange bucket here and this full of de-icing salts, that's all the de-icing salts that it takes to put to make that whole bucket full of water hit the EP stand, EPA standard for um, <clears throat> harming aquatic life. So it's a really powerful chemical and just a little bit is, is causing a lot of pollution in our water. And then think about how much salt you see being used. <clears throat> there has been an upward trend of road salt since the 1960s. The data, you're right, Erin, it changes every year. Currently, we're saying about 400,000 tons statewide um, annually. Uh, that number is like hard to get your head around. I would just say it's a lot of teaspoons of salt. Um, the result of all that salt usage is that currently statewide, we know of 50 water bodies um, over the EPA limit. We know 75 are very close to tipping into that impaired state. Other signs of growing salty water, uh, the water testing that we do shows elevated chloride levels, not just during the traditional winter melting times, which is where it used to be, but now through the spring and even through the summer, we have salty water. Um, and the fresh water, which naturally flushes, should naturally flushes out our lakes and streams in the Twin Cities metro is now salty, so we're not getting fresh water back in. The salty water problem is more widespread than our testing shows. There just isn't the capacity to test all our waters. Known risk factors are 18% road density or road proximity to water bodies. So if you suspect a water body near you may be impaired and you want to be a part of testing, there are citizen testing groups and um, Isaac Walton League has one called Salt Watch. You can sign up online on the Isaac Walton League's uh, test site and they'll send you a testing kit and instructions and you go test and report uh, your findings back to them on an interactive map and it's really helpful. It helps identify at-risk water bodies around the state. So chlorides, um, part of the problem too is they have far-reaching consequences for our freshwater species. And I wanna talk about aquatic life, soil, groundwater, and pets. So uh, what chloride does <clears throat> is it weakens or kills our native aquatic populations, fish, amphibians, insects, plants. A lot of things happen and it depends on the species, but food chains are diminished, reproduction is disrupted, oxygen levels, and lake turning are reduced so that salty water is heavy. It tends to be on the bottom of the lake and it is slowing down the number of times that our lakes are turning. And so that means less, less oxygen. Of course, weakened native species means um, that opens the door for further for invasive species. And that's one of the bad things that salt is doing. The icers in soil alter the soil structure, including its ability to hold water. Plants either fail to thrive or have stunted growth. Overspray directly onto plants. You've seen it like often in grass in the spring, it just plain out kills them. So, and the salty water of course is seeping through the ground and it does eventually reach wells and aquifers. Currently, a third, about a third of Minnesota's shallow monitoring wells statewide have elevated chloride levels, and that's mostly in, in the Twin Cities, but in some outstate urban areas too. We don't yet have impaired drinking water in Minnesota, but two other states, New Hampshire and Wisconsin do, and they don't know what they're gonna do about it when those aquifers get salty. <clears throat> This wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention pets. If, if you're a pet owner, you know that de-icers can irritate your pet's paws, but did you know there are no standards for claims on de-icer packaging? Any company can label their product pet friendly, 
So when you're standing at the store and choosing a de-icer product, about the only thing you can do is check for the ingredient statement, if there even is one, and look for the words chloride or salt. So chlorides don't just affect the environment, they have a huge impact on infrastructure. Just briefly, um, it damages concrete and metal on bridges and roads. You know it damages vehicles, you see rusty vehicles on the road. Uh, you walked into buildings where the interiors have damage and the, the exteriors get damaged too and it kills the landscaping. Um, the costs include premature repair, replacement of items that otherwise would be lasting much longer. And this is both on the public and private side. And frankly, the damage is something um, that we as consumers and taxpayers pay for every day. So we've got some roadblocks um, to reducing. We can't change the side effects that the icers have on the environment and on the infrastructure. It's gonna happen whether that salt is really needed or it's extra. Um, but what we can do is change the amount of de-icer that we use. And almost everybody that SOS talks to will look around and say, yeah, we can lose, use less and maintain safety. So the question is, what in the world is holding us back? And part of the problem is that de-icers have worked so well, so effectively, that just seeing on salt on a property has become an assurance for too many people. And that's the property manager, the applicators, and the public. You know, they expect to see, visually see salt, and it shows the property is being taken care of. Um, there, you might have heard more salt means more safety. There's a lot of pressure for that to happen. And this is especially true in the private sector where properties are really afraid of slip and fall lawsuits. So having, a, having your applicator over salt has become the norm on way too many properties. <clears throat> Even trained applicators um, are put in the position to choose between using their best management practices, which they know all about, and satisfying a property's manager's desire to see salt on a property. And for the applicator, that has to do with keeping that property as a customer. So it's a business issue. And a second part of uh, roadblock is just untrained applicators. And that's mostly in the private sector. And despite Minnesota being home to the nationally recognized smart salt training since 2005, um, we, um, we still need more applicators uh, trained. And in fact, I think we need all of our applicators full steam ahead on training and implementing what they've learned. Um, and we'll go into the bill shortly um, so you can see how that addresses it. Um, but first I think Erin, you wanted to talk a little bit about what training is like, unless yeah. there's questions well, I, on what we just went over. I would love to hear a little bit more about this barrier stuff, because I think this is one of the challenges that we're all addressing is, you know, there's lots of solutions to environmental problems. And one of them is regulation, right? You know, use less, you must use less salt. In this case, it sounds like the real issue is not so much about regulating the amount applied, but like just getting people to actually follow what we know are better practices when it comes to both safety and the amount of salt applied. Is that right? I think that it's that simple. But yeah. we've just gotten used to seeing it. And whether it's somebody calling in and saying to the property manager, I don't see enough salt down there, whether it's a city or a shopping mall. Um, or it's just a property manager being afraid because they don't want to see any slip and fall lawsuits coming at them. And they just call up and, and, and we have applicators tell us all, ta all the time, we tell them they don't need any more salt. We've done, you know, your property is fine. And they, they don't care. Come back out here and put more salt down. Yeah. I mean, are there some, I mean... Well, I guess we're kind of talking a little bit about the better ways to use salt, but like I've seen a lot of really bad uses and I just want to call it a couple of them. Like one is you see people sometimes using salt to melt snow, right? Rather than shovel, they put down salt to melt the snow. Uh, and that probably makes the problem worse. I mean, it actually probably refreezes at some point if it gets cold and then it becomes slippery as opposed to just being snow on the sidewalk. 
Um, are there other like practices you can think of, uh, Sue, that are like particularly bad uses of salt that actually make the prop make make it more likely that folks will slip and fall? To make it more likely for a slip and fall? Yeah. Um, putting, putting, you know, they learn in training that during the storm you really don't want to be putting the salt down, you wanna be, it's like shovel, shovel, shovel and sweep and, you know, get the snow off the surface so that, <clears throat> so that ice doesn't start forming. Um, otherwise you can put down the wrong amount of de-icer, the wrong de-icer and do it in the wrong time and actually create problems. And smart salt training is all about helping applicators know when that is because storms are different temperatures, different amounts, you know, it's, it's, it's an art and a science to apply the icers correctly. Yeah, I wonder if, if we could spend a little bit of time talking about like what the smart salting training teaches. So folks may, may not be aware as, as Suda said that we've had a really successful smart salting training that's been ongoing for quite a while now. Um, our Linnison Pollution Control Agency has been kind of a leader on this. Um, we have had, I think, I heard the other day that up to 20,000 people have gone through the training over the last, you know, 16 years. It's been a while. Um, so there's been a lot of folks that have gone through that training. What are some of the things that they learn in that training? Well, in general, it's um, using science um, and best practices on a property. So science-based um, best, best management practices. And it's about optimizing salt use. Um, and going from like a more is better. So we're not gonna treat this property just as one thing that gets all the same kind of attention and salting, um, but we're gonna do precision application. And I mean, there are manuals and all day long classes to go into this, but um, some of the things that, um, that they talk about, and we just talked a little bit about that getting the, the snow off um, is really key. But even before it starts snowing, preparing a property for their winter operations, like salt can't fix a structural issue, okay? So if you got something on your property that's causing ice to form, you gotta take care of it in the off, off season. And they talk a lot about that and what they do. They talk about levels of service, zoning, closing off. Do you really need that whole property open all winter long? Um, and what parts really need salt and what don't? I, I have some great examples of properties around the city where you can walk on the sidewalks and go into the buildings and you're not going to see any salt because they've done such a great job of snow removal. They're using the sun when they can to, to melt things and ice isn't forming. And, and de-icer on dry pavement does nothing. Well, there's no ice to melt, but it needs some moisture to start doing its work. So when you see the ice or on dry pavement, there is over salting right there. Good to know. Um, so for folks who are not going to go through this whole smart salting training, and I'm also noticing some questions already in the chat about this. Um, what are some takeaways that folks might have from the bigger training that's being done with applicators? Because we all, you know, maybe we have our home or business and we're making decisions on an individual basis about applying salt and other kinds of ways of trying to avoid slip and fall injuries. What are some of the takeaways that you think folks should grab from this training that they can implement right away at their own, at their own place of business or their own home? Well, the, for sure, the, the getting the snow off first and fixing the problems on your property. Um, I'm just looking through my list here. You know, I think I talked a little bit about their, the labeling on the products that you might see at the hardware store or other places that you buy products. The, the people that make those products can say almost anything. Um, we were talking to an organization in St. Paul that had been told by a distributor that what they were using was, um, had no salt in it. And in order to melt, it's got to have some salt in it, but they, they were sure it was an all natural product and it was no salt. Well, what it ended up being was all natural salt from the Great Salt Lake, okay? But it was salt, but it wasn't on the label. So you've got all kinds of that things. And then you have blends. 
Um, you have a couple different kinds of deicers that can be put together. Deicers are temperature specific. They work at, um, they have their own capacity to melt and they work at different temperatures. So when you go to the store and there's no labeling on anything, you don't know exactly what conditions that'll work under. And if you put it down in the, under the wrong conditions, then that's wasteful too. You know, and that can happen on a huge parking lot with an applicator too. Um, I mean, so it sounds like, you know, one of the big deals is temperature and that below a certain temperature salt is very ineffective and that sometimes applying salt when it's too cold won't do any good. Is that, is that also right? That's true. So um, road salt is good to about 15 degrees. Not that it doesn't work at 14 degrees, but it doesn't work as well and it becomes increasingly ineffective. So there are other, a few other um, chlorides that work at um, lower temperatures of that. And that's part of what's taught in training, um, wh what temperatures they work at and how much and what the application rate is. And then application's a big deal because many, many times at, there's too much put on, um, the granular is too close together. I mean, I look at my hand and I think, you know, I probably could, the spread pattern might be something like five or six granules on the size of my hand because, you know, it does, it starts to melt and that circle increases. They don't need to be on top of each other. They don't need to be piled up, whether it's at home on your front steps, you don't need very much. And, and sometimes it's hard to get that spread pattern. Professionals have equipment and and part of what they do in training is talk about calibration and equipment and access to grants to get that kind of stuff because we want our professionals that are using huge amounts to be out there with equipment that puts the right, not, we don't want to put down too much salt when they have the option not to. Yeah. One of the things that I, I do around my house just because I think it's, it, it's, it's cheaper and it works is I like to use turkey grit or what a lot of, you might see these as, as uh, granite chips is another way it's put it was a, it's called turkey grit because it's usually used for uh, commercial turkey operations to give some grit in the crop of turkeys um, but it's basically the little chips of granite that are pretty grippy and you put that down and it gives it's basically a, a fancy form of gravel the nice thing about it is it's pretty it's big enough and at the end of the year, I can just sweep it up, put it in a bucket, and I can use it again next year. So it doesn't go anywhere, and it's non-toxic, and it doesn't run off. So it's just another. So it's not just always about melting that ice. Sometimes it's about providing some traction on that ice, and you can use a lot of non-toxic alternatives to do that. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought up uh, cleaning it up afterwards because whether it's extra turkey grit or extra sand, I mean, those are going to, if they get into the waterways, they're gonna start clogging things up. Um, but even like I said, um, granular de-icing salts on dry pavement, sweep it up, reuse it. Don't let it go down the storm drain into our waterways. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, well, that's really helpful. I think, cause I think a lot of times folks are like, oh, there's training or whatever it, it's, and, and, and you're right. There's a lot of technical detail that goes into this training. These are multi-day trainings that are conducted sometimes. And they go really into depth about some of the equipment that's used to apply it for commercial applicators. A lot of that won't apply to an individual who has a home or a business, but a lot of those principles that apply there are, use, are very useful for homeowners and for other business owners. Um, who just want to try to take a little bit of whack but this the just the general rule is apply when it makes sense use less of it sweep up any extra those are some really basic principles that will probably help put everyone in good stead if they were to follow them. and if you're really worried about it and um this is also for the professionals put a little sign out that says it's icy here if there's something you absolutely can't control warn people that are on your property yeah, usually the the thing that I see a lot is uh, downspouts that 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 release water onto yeah. a sidewalk or right next to an entrance, and that can be that that's a good example of one of those things that you can fix in the off season to make sure that it's not creating a, a slip and fall hazard later in the winter. Um, so this isn't ahead. something to do at home, but if you are working for a company and you're seeing too much salting, and maybe you talked to people in your organization and getting into the BMPs, 
you know, it can be a little squishy, but there's a really concrete thing that you can ask for. And that is, you can ask the property manager, the contract you have with the applicator, are they charging by the tons or the amount of salt used? Or are they talk, are they charging by the service they offer? Because charging by the amount of salt used um, contributes to oversalting. That's not something for at home, but it's definitely something, you know, we all see salt and we're managing it on our own properties, but we see it where we work and where we do business. Yeah. So like recognizing there's a problem, recognizing that there's a solution to this problem, I, I wanted to pivot a little bit to the bills that are being heard this week at the legislature and also to let you know that uh, this bill was, has got two hearings coming up tomorrow and Thursday, one in the Minnesota Senate in the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Policy Committee. And then on Thursday in the House Environment and Natural Resources Policy and, and Finance Committee, they're both hearing versions of this bill. There was a question in the chat earlier about these bill numbers. And if you're looking to track this bill as it moves forward in the process, the bill numbers, and I think Adam already put this in the chat, but I'll repeat it here. The Senate bill is uh, SF2768 and the House bill is HF2908. And both of these bills are up for a hearing this week, um, both at 1 p.m., so another lunchtime kind of arrangement. Uh, Sue will be testifying at the legislature for both, uh, both the House and the Senate, which is fantastic. We're really happy to have her voice there. Um, and also a number of other folks from watershed management organizations, um, business groups, environmental groups are all coming together to support these bills. Um, and so the reason why this, this bill has got this bipartisan support is because of kind of the unique nature of both the problem, but also in which the, way, the ways in which this bill pr proposes a solution. So the, the bills that are currently up at the Capitol do a couple of things. One is they establish best practices. They establish that there is a best practice for applying salt in statute uh, and also to mandate, in this case, what we already have, which is an education program to certify applicators about those best management practices. And we've talked about some of them already today about temperature of application, the amount of salt that's applied, when, it, when and where it's applied, um, all of that stuff is in turn included in that training, which has been ongoing for quite a while now. Um, it was certify applicators who go through that training as being certified commercial applicators of salt. Um, and then would limit liability for slip and fall injuries if, li if a commercial applicator is certified and if they follow those best management practices. Remember, those best management practices are, are not just about reducing the amount of salt, but also about making safer sidewalks and safer places to walk. And so um, it's not just that there's liability being removed from something that somebody who's doing something wrong. This is about giving people an actual signal and certainty that if they follow those best management practices, that they will get a, they'll get the benefit of that, that they will be able to go to a court if they need to and say, we are following what we knew to be best practices that have been certified by the state, developed through science, and that should be a defense against uh, any potential liability on, uh, on a slip and fall injury on their sidewalks. I mean, and I'll be really clear here, like I broke my ankle about 10 years ago uh, in a slip and fall injury and a rather gruesome example of it on a very slippery day. Um, and I watched as my insurance company for my home fought with my health insurer and other people about who was responsible for paying for my injury. <laughs> and so liability is a real question and it's important, uh, but we really want to reward and make sure that applicators know that if they follow these practices, that they will be protected. Um, because otherwise they fall prey to what Sue was talking about earlier, which is a property owner who says, I don't really care what your training says. I want to see salt and I want to see a lot of it. Uh, and that becomes kind of the standard operating procedure unless there is a strong push uh, to make sure that folks understand what those practices are, which we've done a great job of in Minnesota, but also to kind of connect that to liability around this question. Lastly, it would require certified applicators to report annually how much salt they use, which actually is a really valuable tool for us to know more about how much salt is being applied to our, 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 to our roadways, to our sidewalks, to our parking lots. Um, as Sue mentioned earlier, 400,000 tons approximately every year in the Twin Cities alone. And that number is just astounding to think about. I don't know how many teaspoons that is, but it's an awful lot. <laughs> So where we're at right now is the, the bill has been introduced in the House and the Senate. We have a strong bipartisan list of authors in the Senate and House 
Senator Kerry Rood is also the chair of the Environment Natural Resources Policy Committee, is the, is the, is the author of the uh, Senate version, and she has co-authors, uh, Senator Dave Senjum, a Republican from Rochester, Senator Carla Nelson, who's a Republican from Rochester as well, uh, Senator Kari Dietzik, who's a Democrat from Minneapolis, um, and uh, Senator Jim Abler, who is a Republican from Coon Rapids, are all the senators who are sponsoring that bill. And on the House side, uh, Representative Peter Fisher, who's been a longtime champion of this bill, uh, really water focused prior to the, uh, I think he's also the chair of a, of a commission on water and the subcommittee on water policy. Uh, and he has a number of co-authors uh, in on his bill as well, more than I could probably mention here. But this first stop is important. It goes to, uh, in, many, in Minnesota legislative parlance, there are these deadlines you have to meet for a bill to be viable moving forward. Um, it's really kind of unheard of to have a bill clear both the first and second deadline, which is to be heard in the House and the Senate and get an upvote by the end of the second week of session. And we are on track to do that with this bill, uh, which is really important. Um, and it could be either a bill that moves forward in the process as a, whether we would call a standalone bill, a bill that is passed off of the House floor and off of the Senate floor. And if there are differences in language, they go to a conference committee to work that out. Um, or a lot of legislation these days, unfortunately, gets rolled into bigger budget bills and becomes part of the conversation near the end of session, um, which is both good and bad. I mean, ultimately, you want to take, uh, there's a lobbyist saying that says you want to jump on whatever train is moving. Uh, so whatever gets you to the end of the finish line, you want to jump on. Um, but in this case, a lot of the language disputes around the liability protections. Um, there are a number of interest groups, including the trial lawyers, the Landscaper Association, the, the, um, uh, the uh, Insurance Federation, all have opinions about what the right language is for liability. We're trying to work with all of those interest groups to come up with language that everyone can live with. Uh, and that would provide a benefit, the benefit that we just described earlier, providing certainty to commercial applicators who are using salt in their work. So what can you do? Um, first of all, we would encourage you, first of all, to, to think about the way you use salt on your own property, at your apartment building, wherever, wherever it is that you have your own little patch of ground, you know, that patch of ground matters. And so thinking about what's smart to use and how to best use salt in, in the most sparing way possible while providing safety is really worthwhile. I think a couple of folks have put some good resources already in the chat. So if you're interested in following some of those links, that'd be great. Um, we will have an action alert and a couple of folks have asked about this as well. Out in the next couple of weeks as this bill continues to move forward, um, I'll just be honest with you, we did not expect to see it move this quickly. Um, so we're not quite ready to have folks reach out to their legislators yet. The good news is that we've had an incredibly positive reception at both of these committees, and we expect that the vote tomorrow and the Senate committee will be near and unanimous or unanimous in support of the bill, and we hope for a similar result in the House on Thursday. Um, as you, uh, One thing you can do, and this is going to sound weird, but I'll say it anyway, watching the hearing matters. Um, there are ways to watch online hearings at both the House and the Senate. It's very easy to go to house.mn or senate.mn, and there's a link right there to watch live video. Um, they watch to see how many folks watch these hearings. They're really interested in knowing how much public interest there is in a bill. So if you wanna learn more about the process, this bill is gonna move through and move more, learn more about this issue and also show some support for the bill moving forward, yeah, showing up online virtually to watch this hearing would be great. And that's available really easily to you um, online at either house.mn or senate.mn. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the gist of it. But I wanted to uh, kick this back to Sue for a minute. I mean, Sue, you've been working on this bill now for a, a while. Um, and uh, it's really great news that we've got some early momentum on this bill. Um, but we've had early momentum before and it's kind of fizzled out. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think might be different this time around uh, compared to the last last couple of times we've tried to get this bill through. Um, I'm going to compl compliment MCEA. I mean, you, you have put together a great coalition and um, it has broad reach and um, you the right people are being contacted. We have great authors. Um, and, and the um, energy is happening early. And, and I think that's key. I, I think that didn't happen before. And you have to be organized ahead of these deadlines and get people on the bandwagon. 
Thanks. I mean, I appreciate that, the kind words. I think it's, again, it wouldn't be possible to do any of that early action if it weren't for the fact that folks are already intimately familiar with it. Like, so that, that necklace you're wearing, or I should say the, the teaspoon that's around your neck. Uh, when we met with Senator author, Senate author Carrie Rood, she, she pulled out her teaspoon and said that she still had that and she remembered it. And so it's that work that I think is still resonating and it makes it easy to talk to people about the bill. So it's really up to you. I also noticed Joe Nabley just commented about um, the uh, smart salting uh, resources on the Mississippi Man Watershed Management Organization's website, MWMO. Um, FYI, M MWMO will be testifying in favor of this bill tomorrow. And we've been working with one of their uh, folks over at their office to provide its, uh, their, their perspective on the need for smart salting. So uh, they have great resources. And I think we should really be appreciative of some of the leadership on this issue by the watershed management organizations in the Twin Cities. Um, I know that in my area, I live in Fridley, we have three WMOs, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, Coon Creek, and Rice Creek Watershed District, and all three of them are really active on this issue. Um, so, and I, I serve on a city commission in Fridley as well for environmental quality work. And um, our, our staff at our city are really into this and are really making sure that they take this to heart. So it's really cool to see it play out both on the, on the ground level, but also at the legislature. Um, I wanted to turn to some of our questions because we have some really smart, interesting questions in here. Um, and I think one of them is a reasonable question and it's one that I wanted to actually talk a little bit about, which is if the safe level of salt applications are used, won't we still have waters contaminated by salt? And I think the answer is yes, we will still have waters contaminated by salt, but there's also a threshold issue here. Um, and, and also we want to, in order to make progress, we're going to have to reduce the amount of salt, period. So I don't know if, Sue, if you have any additional thoughts about this question about, you know, even if we reduce salt, won't we still have salty water? Um, my understanding is that over time, quite a bit of time, we'll clear some of that out, but we've got to stop adding to it to even get to that point. Um, we're, we're a long ways from that. Yes, we're, I think we're still gonna have salty water. Yeah, I mean, I think if I were not mistaken, but Lake Johanna is one of the kind of the poster children, I should say, for a salty water body. I mean, we're getting to the point now where one of the most popular swimming beaches in the Twin Cities is on Lake Johanna up in Roseville. And, you know, I think we're about to cross the threshold where this, the, that will no longer be a body of fresh water. It'll be called a brackish water body at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And part of the problem is we really don't have a good grip on just how many water bodies are impaired because the state doesn't have the capacity to test. The real technical professional testing is expensive and you're not going to go out and do it every year. So we really need to be pulling back just with the general knowledge that this is not good for our lakes, especially. So someone, uh, Lori, sorry, Lori Emblem mentions about what about brine restriction for water softeners. And I, I want to cue that up a little bit because there are multiple sources of, of salty parameters and chloride pollution in our waterways. One of them is water softeners. Yeah. Um, so for folks who are, uh, I, I live in Fridley where we have groundwater uh, and quite hard groundwater. So many people have water softeners in my suburb where I live. And what water softeners do is they exchange one ion for another, right? They get rid of, they, they swap out salt ions for uh, calcium chloride ions, which are what cause hardness. Um, unfortunately, the downside of that is it makes for softer water, a little bit more enjoyable shower, perhaps, a little bit easy, more easily sud sudsing water uh, for washing up. But the end result is salty water that goes into our wastewater treatment stream and eventually is discharged into our rivers. Um, and so it's one of those things where like, there are better and more efficient water softeners that use less salt to achieve the outcome. And if you are one pers a person who has a water softener, I'd encourage you to think about that, especially as it comes time to replace your water softener. Um, but there, it, it is a, it's probably about one third of the problem, if I understand it correctly, in terms of our added salt is, is coming from these water softeners. And this bill doesn't directly address that, but there are other strategies in place to try to reduce the amount of salt from water softening. I don't know if you have any more to add to, them, add to that. Uh, road salts are the number one 
a contribution, but water softeners are right behind it. And, and water softeners are an issue statewide, just to, not in the metro. I mean, we have a lot of hard water out state. Yeah. And, and, that, and the weird thing about that is that you take, you're taking water out of the ground, which is hard, softening it, and then releasing it with the extra salt into surface water. Yeah. Right. So you're kind of taking, you're adding a lot to our surface water burden uh, just because you're adding more water and you're adding more salt along with it. And um, fertilizers are a big um, source of salt. So you've got that happening too, whether it's our lawns or our fields. That's totally right. And so uh, the word salt too, by the way, we oftentimes equate with like table salt or chlorides. There are a number of different kinds of salts that are uh, problems for water pollution. Um, one that you might be familiar with are sulfates. Uh, and sulfates are another form of salt, a chemical, a chemical salt that um, have similar problems. They accumulate, they're difficult to remove from waterways. In that case, we also know that it damages wild rice. It can also cause the more methylation of mercury and to move up the, the food chain of fish. And so all of these parameters that we call salts um, chemically, they all have similar problems uh, when it comes to pollution and that they accumulate over time and they're very difficult to remove. Uh, let's see. When I go into a local business, asks Mary uh, Haltvik, I see way too much salt, especially right in front of the entrance, sometimes piles of it. <laughs> Who should I contact about this? The owner, the manager, the mayor, the city manager? What do you think, Sue? Who should Mary talk to if she sees that at a local business? This is a really good question and a hard one to answer, Mary, because it depends. And maybe all of them, you know, if you if the business is locally owned and you can actually talk to the owner and they're doing their own winter maintenance there there you can talk to them right there but if the property manager is off-site and a lot of times people somebody in in the business will just say you know I don't know they just come and do it and then you have to go try and find the property manager uh, sometimes it helps to contact your city if the property manager isn't listening and nothing gets done because um, cities, both cities and watersheds really want to see salt reduction and um, they are finding ways to be helpful and uh, so you could do that too. It's, it's um, anybody from SOS will tell you it takes a lot of time and work, you know, you might write a letter, you might make a phone call, um, it just, it requires persistence, I would say. And I would encourage you to do it because the more voices we have, so many people say, geez, nobody ever complains. So please start complaining. <laughs> Complaint's probably the wrong word, but asking for reduction, ask them to clean up the extra that's there. And I, and I, and I think ultimately like it's, it is a money saving uh, tool. I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to miss, um, I believe it was Michael, I think, above asking if there was uh, any data or studies about the impact, how much, how much money it costs from oversalting in terms of the impact on our public infrastructure. And I believe the answer is yes. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. Um, I was told by another advocate that there's a kind of formula about for every ton of salt applied, it does X number of dollars worth of damage to public infrastructure. Uh, so I know that folks have been working on that, uh, but certainly for an individual property owner, you know, if they can save money by applying less salt and it it's more effective and it does less damage to their sidewalks so they don't have to replace it every 10 years, it's all, it's a win, win, win for everybody. And it's worth mentioning it. Um, and I don't think it necessarily needs to be in the form of a complaint. I think you're right to say that it doesn't necessarily be a complaint, but at least saying, hey, I noticed you got a lot of salt out there. It doesn't look like it's working. You know, and, you know, we know that there's a lot of extra salt that ends up in our waterways, which you think about using less of it. Um, and that kind of soft touch might work with people. So I, and I ask them, are they aware that there is a, a training program and it's either free or low cost? And um, could I get you the information on that and just pass it on? Yeah. A couple more uh, questions and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move to concluding here, but I think just, I wanna make sure I answer a couple of these. One question was about, will legislation have, will the legislation have any relevance to individual applicators like TaskRabbit or other kinds of online uh, task, task completion things? The answer is yes, if those, that individual gets certified, right? So 
the, this is all a voluntary program. And so anybody who wants to be certified in it, whether they are a property owner or an applicator or just someone who's interested in it can take the class. Um, but I, it would work the same way for that individual applicator, regardless of how they're hired to do the job, as long as they were a, a certified applicator and they followed the procedures and best practices, they would get the benefit of the liability protection. Um, and one other question was about, um, can the bill or should the bill include some funding for the U of M to do research on ways to take salt out of our lakes? It's a good question. I think one of the challenges here is that right now, the only technology that really would work to take salt out of lakes is reverse osmosis water treatment, um, which can be done, but it's very, very expensive and very energy intensive. And so most of the time where you see reverse osmosis systems used are they're like under your sink, right? They are smaller systems that are designed to target just that water used for consumption. Um, but so the answer to your question is the, the bill does not include funding to remove salt from our lakes. It's taking the opposite approach of just trying to keep salt from getting in the lakes in the first place. Um, obviously, we've got existing problems and we'll see what we can do to fix those as well. Um, and one last question that what Michael asked was, when's the hearing on Thursday? Both on Wednesday and Thursday, the hearings are at 1 p.m. And so you can find that information on the legislative website, house.mn for the Thursday hearing and senate.mn for the Senate hearing on Wednesday. Um, any last words, Sue? I really appreciate you taking the time today to sit down with us and talk through this issue. Um, and again, thanks for all the work you've done on this in the past. I'm wondering if there's any parting words you want to give to our audience. I, I want to say thank you to the audience for being here and being curious about the problem and to ask you, please, um, to be in support of the bill. Thank you so much. And thank you again to all of our supporters. Um, again, your work, our work is your work and you make it possible. So please think about making a contribution if you support our work at mncenter.org slash donate. Um, again, this is one of a series of legislative webinars and we are ready to roll out our full legislative webinar series later this week or early next week. So watch for an email that talks about a variety of topics. Uh, it just so happens that we got lucky timing this one with the two hearings that are following it on Wednesday and Thursday. So it's really helpful uh, to timing, but we got lucky on this one. Uh, our goal is to have that list out later this week. So basically every other week at this time on, at noon, which seems to work pretty well for folks. Um, you can always find more information about this bill, all the bills that we're tracking at MCEA um, on our website. At, it will be at mncenter.org. Uh, at the top right corner, there is a take action button, which has all of our existing action alerts. There's not one for the SALT bill yet, but there will be soon. Um, and also, if you go under the tab that says how we win, there's a making policy uh, tab there. And it takes you to a page where we have all of our testimony, our fact sheets on everything that we talk about at the legislature, uh, as well as a bill tracker that's got our position on every bill that we're, we're tracking, as well as all the resources we've used, whether it's our testimony at the legislature, fact sheets, et cetera. And all of those links are being added to the chat right now by Adam, who's doing a great job. Lastly, we're gonna, we, like all of our webinars, we will post a recording of this one soon. So if you saw this and thought, hey, there's somebody I know that really needs to see this, this uh, presentation, please share it with them. And we'll have it up on our website as well as on our social media accounts later today. If you, know, if you don't know where to find it, we also have a YouTube channel for MCEA. And so you can go to our YouTube channel at any time and all of our webinars are highlighted there and you can watch them, share them with other people and we encourage you to do that. Um, so thanks again for being here. My name is Aaron Clems from Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. I've been joined by Sue Neeson from Stop Over Salting. And we really appreciate your time this, this afternoon. And we hope that you'll go take a look at our website and also hopefully attend one of these hearings later this week and support the salt, uh, smart salting bills. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Enjoy you. your peanut butter and jelly. Thanks again, Sue. And we'll see you again soon. Have a great day.